Well, there's the background, and the story just keeps getting more bizarre and more unbelievable from there. Joining us now outside uh, the Los Angeles Courthouse Live is Court TV's Beth Karras, who's covering this case and has been doing unbelievable research. Thank you very much for sending that file with all the court filings. I can't believe what I've been reading, Ms. Karras. I'm going to talk to you in just a moment. I also want to mention that in California, as well as Jeffrey Steinberger, a veteran criminal and defense attorney, entertainment attorney as well, who's represented many celebrity clients. And then with me here in studio, while Jack is on a day off today, is John Pavia, former prosecutor who is a corporate counselor, also teaches law at Quinnipiac College in Connecticut. So this guy's going to have the answers to the tough questions. Beth, let me go out to you to start with, though, because as I followed this case and started in on it, I thought it sounded pretty open and shut. When you read all the court filings, when you read the autopsy report, when you read the statements that were made to the... Yeah, that's who we're talking about. And let me tell you, the tone was so unbelievable because at the most, what the police were doing was speaking to each other. You could hear their transcripts. They're talking to each other over the radio. And this guy down on the floor is screaming back up at them and they're not responding to him. Jeffrey Steinberger, you've had celebrity clients. So look, we all know that celebrity clients tend to be a little different than the average bear. But this is pretty unbelievable stuff that I was reading. Agree or disagree? Ashley, it's different stuff, and that's why you're covering it. This is a Hollywood trial. This is what they indicted them for. And, you know, you're talking about the guy uh, being belligerent and yelling and using expletives. It doesn't make him a murderer. It just doesn't make him a murderer. And the more you try and push, push stuff down a jury's throat, all these tangential items about him being a yeller or a screamer, he says dirty words. The jury is wise. The jury is smart. They want to see where the meat is. Show me some evidence. Show me how he can connect this up forensically with witnesses, with testimony that he killed this woman. Stop giving me all this expletives and he's a bad person and his hair looks like crap and he doesn't look and he looks weird. That hey, ain't Jeffrey. It. That ain't it for a trial. Hey, listen, you know? I'm not a lawyer, okay? I am the kind of person that you are talking to in the jury box. I'm the person who listens to all of this wondering, where are you taking me? What's this whole story about? What kind of people am I dealing with here? And who am I deliberating about? And this stuff does hit home. When I hear a guy like this with a dead woman sitting next to him screaming that he owns the police department and that the chief of police worked for him and who the hell do you cops think you are? By the way, I didn't even put half the stuff in there. Uh, it's just too dirty. I, I just can't read it on the air. We literally can't put it on the air, what he said to them. And the way he said, you think you're such big men, big men in big suits. Meanwhile, there's a woman next to him dead who he is calling a piece of SHI you know what. That does make a difference. And it, it sort of speaks to the character of the person we're dealing with. It tells me there's a lot of hubris and someone who doesn't give a, a you-know-what about what's going on and certainly doesn't think he needs to be prosecuted for it. Ashley, hubris is hubris, but it's not murder. And you know what? He does have a dead body there. He has a woman who has her brains blown out, who has her teeth blown out. There's blood all over the place. He's afraid. And if he didn't do it, what would his reaction been then? I mean, would it have been any different? Do we know? Can we tell yet? We don't know until all the evidence is in. I'll tell you, so what, my, I'll tell you what my reaction would have been. If I were in his condition, if I were in his shoes and there was a terrible accident, I probably would have called the police. And, and here's where I'm going with this. The jury's going to be very interested to find out what kind of things Phil did in the moments after the shooting. And one thing he didn't do was call the police. He did call the police a whole bunch of nasty things when they showed up. Let me just tell you what he said to... Uh, to Esquire magazine in 2003, Phil Spector gave that magazine an interview, and here it is. He says, there's no case. They have no case. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything. I called the police myself. I called the police. This is not Bobby Blake. This is not the Menendez brothers. They have no case. If they had a case, I'd be sitting in jail right now. Really, Phil? Really? You called the police, Phil? You said it twice. You said the words to Esquire magazine twice. You called the police like you were doing something to help the situation while Lana was bleeding dead beside you in the foyer. Well, let's have a listen to what Alan Jackson, the prosecutor in this case, said upon opening this case regarding what you did with telephones in the foyer. Here's Alan Jackson. Telephones. In a gigantic house in almost every room. Call 
for help from Philip Spector. Phil, Phil, why'd you tell Esquire you called the police? You yourself called the police when not one phone call was made to the police about the woman you claim killed herself right in front of you. All right, Jeffrey Steinberger, I'm putting it back at you, baby. This is tough stuff. That is not something that you want to hear if you're Phil Spector and his defense team. No, it would be better if he called the police and said I had an accident and I did 9-1. That would be the best of all opportunities. He's got a dead woman there. Ashley, what do you want this guy to do? You know, if he's innocent, which we're supposedly to presume he's innocent, and look, let me get this straight. I'm a criminal defense lawyer, so I'm giving you just the defense aspect. If this guy killed her, you're absolutely right. It follows the personality, follows the stuff. But in putting it before the jury and showing what he is, just because he doesn't call at that particular time, he could have had a million things on his mind. If he didn't do it, and just look from the aspect, if he didn't do it, he wanted to try and see if she was alive. He wanted to make sure something was going on. He couldn't believe that this happened. We're talking about all this stuff. And when he's talking to Esquire magazine later on, after he's been indicted, after he's been arrested, it's a whole different story. So, you know, you can't make these prejudgments and say that they're actual fact. No, I can't this make the prejudgments. You're trial. absolutely right. But I don't like it when people lie lie, lie, and he lied, lied, lied by saying to Esquire magazine, I called the police, I was the one who did all this. That's stuff that doesn't fit well. And, and I don't like it when people call police effing losers and all the rest. I think it's pretty nasty and I don't like that particularly. Now, on the other hand, you will not believe some of the forensic evidence they have in defense of Phil Spector. When you hear it, you will think none of this makes any sense at all that this guy had nothing to do with it. He was nowhere near Lana Clarkson when that gun went off. Very, very hard when you don't have gun residue or blood spatter all over your right arm or your clothes. And yet she does. We're going to talk with Dorothy Melvin. We're going to hear her on the stand coming up. What did she have to say about what happened to her way back when? So many things to talk about. And joining us live from outside that courthouse in Los Angeles is Court TV's Beth Karras. And also in L.A. with us today is Jeffrey Steinberger, veteran criminal defense and entertainment attorney. Here in studio with me while Jack is on a day off is John Pavia, former prosecutor and law professor. So, John, let me start with you. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, things didn't look good for Phil. Going into this case, things really didn't look good. Right. And then you hear forensic evidence like that. That's prosecution being able to cross-examine him. I want to get both of our attorneys to comment on that. First to you, uh, Jeffrey Stein. Brenner, do you think that this is a, a bit of a, a gift? I mean, to, to the layperson, it looks like a gift to the defense attorneys. Or do you do you sort of ascribe to what Beth is saying? This is something that you all of a sudden, oh, God, you got to put your thinking cap on, figure out how to deal with this one. Ashley, you know, when you said, uh, why didn't he just say I did it? Most people would just say that. You know what? The opposite is exactly true. Eighty-five percent of the people do say they did it. It's just not a criminal trial. This is not a celebrity criminal trial. But every day in this courtroom, 85% of these people plead to murder and say, I did it. I confess to it. They do it in a police station. They do it in a court of law. They don't do it on camera. And when they have, uh, they're a celebrity and they, they're the biggest record producer in the world. And they got all this camera in their time. So when you say, you know, why didn't he say that? Because he probably didn't do it in his head and maybe actually in fact. But 85% of the people that do do it, that get arrested every day for a murder and any criminal crime out in California, New York, and all the United States, they cop to it. I can't say, believe I what you're saying. Time. I watch cops on a regular basis and all those thugs who get arrested <laughs> seem to have this superiority complex and they're all like, you got the wrong guy, copper, get off my back and get you. I've got my rights and don't you cuff me. And what do you think, John Pavia? If you were a defense attorney in this case, do you think it would be a gift that the prosecutors didn't introduce these uh, these uh, just unbearably dirty sticks? Oh, okie dokie. Real quickly, Jeffrey Steinberger, uh, you know, California's been taking a lot of pot shots in the press lately for the big celebrity trials, um, particularly the prosecution and the efforts in prosecuting people like Robert Blake, uh, Michael Jackson, O.J. Simpson. Things didn't go so well for prosecutors in those criminal trials. What are you hearing about the prosecutorial team in this celebrity trial? Well, Ashley, Be honest. Uh, three down, <laughs> you three down, you. three down, three down, no winners. Okay, so L.A. is looking for a win here. And, you know, I got a, I got a real problem with the forensics, and I don't think they're going to get a win here. This is just a guess, but it's an intelligent guess. Uh, 
you got a lot of flim flam, you got a lot of fluff, but it's really going to come down to the forensics and the agonal breath, and it's going to come down to blood splatter. And that was really a good point. If Cutler could really prove up, if he could really prove up what he did in his opening, that those forensics are going to show that uh, Spectre was away from her when she got shot. Serious East Coast lawyers out there, thick with the New Jersey accents and all the rest. You think it's going to play well in Peoria? You think the California jurors are going to like these Easterners coming? I think they love it. You I do? Think they, yeah, because it, it it actually uh, it's it's fiction come true, and and it just it's more fiction come true. It's all right, on. I got to say goodbye to everybody. You've all been terrific. Beth Karras, as usual, brilliant. You know everything. I can never stump you. Thank you so much for your work, <laughs> madam. Jeffrey Steinberger, good to talk to you. It's not going to be the last time. Look forward to sparring in the future. And John Pavia, good of you to uh, sit in while Jack's been off. Sure appreciate all of your insight today. Thanks to all of you. In the meantime, let me tell you something.